Thanks everyone for being here tonight. I am Stephanie with Ada Soil and Water Conservation District and I would like to welcome you to the Treasure Valley Pollinator Project special Earth Day event, Expanding My Worldview. We started the, the Pollinator Project as a way to both educate our community about the importance of pollinators and to get 64,000 flowering plants into the ground in parks, farms, and backyards across the Treasure Valley. If you haven't already, you may purchase your flat of flowers from our website adaswcd.org. I'll go ahead and put that in the chat for everyone. Um, and by being a part of this regional effort, you're helping increase local pollinator habitat. So on behalf of the bees, moths, butterflies, beetles, and other pollinators, thank you. So for anyone unable to make it tonight, we're, we will be recording this class for viewing at a later date. And how we'll um, go about this is the last 10 minutes of the event is reserved for a question and answer session. So if you have questions during, during the event, go ahead and type those in the chat box at any time. Um, and we'll go ahead and ask our speakers those questions at the end. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and if your question is for a particular speaker, go ahead and indicate that as well in the chat. Um, just some Zoom housekeeping tips. Just remember to keep your video and audio off. Um, throughout the presentation. It's just easier for everyone um, to be able to see and hear our, our wonderful speakers tonight. So today is Earth Day, and I would like to start off by inviting us all to expand our world, world view and to think deeply about our relationship with the Earth. What does this place we call home mean to you? Maybe you have a special place in nature you like to visit or have fond memories of exploring wilderness as a child. Maybe in the busyness of life, you have lost your connection to the natural world, and this is something you're hoping to rediscover. Whatever our experience, the earth has given us some, given something to all of us, food, shelter, joy, adventure, connection. With these gifts comes responsibility, responsibility to acknowledge past and current injustices and responsibility to do better in the, in the future. We would like to acknowledge that we are on land unjustly taken from Shoshone and Bannock, Shoshone Bannock and Shoshone Paiute tribes, people who tended this part of the world for 12,000 years. We recognize their indigenous, indigenous wisdom and the way they lived in harmony with the earth, with reciprocity rather than exploitation. Tonight is a chance to dig deep, reconnect, and challenge common assumptions. The earth has much to teach us when we take the time to listen. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Joel Sauter is our first speaker. Joel is a wildlife biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. He works out of the Lewiston office and coordinates pollinator work statewide. He manages the Idaho portion of the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. So welcome, Joel. Please begin whenever you're ready. Oh, you're on mute. That would help, wouldn't it? Okay. All right, is it? There we go. Is that working? All good. Is we, are we all good? I can't see anybody. I don't. I don't see it yet. Um. Okay. Sorry for the pause. It says it should be. Which are you not seeing a screen? You don't um, ask anything from my feed? No, I don't see it. Oh, wait, it's coming. There it is. There we go. Okay, hold on. Let me kick this into there. Does that look right? Yep, it looks good to me. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties. You'd think after I'd figure this out. So, my name is Joel Sauter, as was mentioned, I'm a wildlife biologist for Idaho Fish and Game. Um, and tonight I have the pleasure of talking about uh, citizen science efforts that are informing pollinator conservation here in Idaho and across the Pacific Northwest and actually across the United States. So I will just jump into it. Hopefully you guys were able to attend last week's workshop um, that covered a lot of the information about bees and pollinators in general. Not going to recap that or why we should care about pollinators, but I love this uh, demonstration that the Xerxes Society did uh, a few years ago in collaboration with Whole Foods on the importance of pollinators and bees, which is particularly to our food supply. So this is a typical Whole Foods grocery store if we have pollinators. 
And this is what it looks like when we wouldn't, if we don't have pollinators. You can see, I'll flip back and forth between these, all the apples goes away, the berries go away, the leafy greens in the back wall go away. Uh, a lot of the citrus stays, I think the avocados go away. That makes me the saddest of it all, if I'm honest. Um, but we rely a lot on pollinators. Um, basically, you eat better with bees. Um, and this is another great demonstration of how insect pollination is produces better fruit. And it kind of describes how um, bees produce better fruits and if it relies on self-pollinization or wind pollinization, the fruit just isn't quite as attractive and nutritious. So tonight we're here to talk about citizen science. Um, and I just wanted to mention briefly that there is tons of citizen science projects that people can get involved in. Everything from astronomy to zoology has a project these days. This website is a great one to go to to find them. It's a kind of a, a list of them. It's called SciStarter. And I'll be referencing a, a lot of websites through my little talk tonight. They'll all be at the end if you want to take a screenshot of that. And I'll try to put them in the chat later on for people to use. So SciStarter is a great place to find a project that interests you. But tonight we're going to be talking about pollinators. Um, one of the, and I, but in the grand scheme of things, I would be negligent if I didn't talk about iNaturalist. This is probably the flagship citizen science platform where any and every observation that a person makes about a plant or an animal can be cataloged. And so this is the uh, current status of iNaturalist observations for Idaho, observations of approximately 6,000 species, um, 127,000 observations recorded just by the general public reporting things that they see while they're going about their lives. So this is one place that would take any kind of observation you make. Um, but tonight I'm gonna to be highlighting four citizen science projects focused on pollinators. Um, one's the Lost Ladybug Project. The second is the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper, the Great Sunflower Project. And finally, the one that's closest and nearest and dearest to my heart is the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. So we'll jump right into these. The atlas is, or the, the ladybug project, um, while ladybugs aren't maybe a traditional pollinator, this project is so much fun I had to highlight it. Um, and it's a great one to do with kids. Um, you guys may or may not know that many of the ladybugs that you can buy uh, through garden catalogs are not our native species. And there has been a precipitous decline in our native ladybug species, one in particular called the nine spotted ladybug that started this project. Um, and the project is pretty simple in that you go out, find some ladybugs, take great pictures of them, uh, look at the handy dandy guide to see if you can identify them, upload the pictures to the website, um, and they will be entered into the database and that will be contributing to what ladybug, where we know these ladybugs occur, and we're documenting both non-native ones and hopefully maybe finding reserve populations of our native species. The second project is the milkweed mapper. Maybe some of you heard this fall the sad news that western monarch uh, populations have declined dramatically yet again. They were down 90 percent this year, and they are down 99% from a little over 20 years, 25 years ago. This year's count was about 2,000 monarchs wintering on the California coast, which is particularly dire. Um, but monarchs are milkweed obligates. They only lay their eggs on milkweeds and their larvae only feed on milkweed until they metamorphose into adult, adults. So having plentiful milkweed is important to the life cycle of monarchs. Uh, and so Idaho Fish and Game partnered with numerous uh, other state agencies and the Xerxes Society to sponsor this website uh, to document where we have monarch observations and their needed uh, milkweed. So it's very similar to the ladybug mapping project. Take a photo when you see a monarch or a uh, a milkweed plant, uh, record a location to go with it, log on to the website, upload your evidence, your pictures of it, hopefully, report the location, um, and you're good to go. 
and you will have made a contribution to uh, monarch conservation. You can see here in this figure that the green dots represent where milkweed has been documented across the western 11 states and then the orange dots are where we have monarch observations. You do get involved in this, it would be nice to know that the difference between monarchs and viceroys, it's a species that masquerades as a monarch. So if you are out on the lookout for monarchs, uh, you need to tell the difference between these two species. They're the ones most commonly confused. You look for that black line that's crossing the hind wing on the viceroy that the monarch doesn't have. And then finally, I guess a last word about milkweed is just it's as close to probably as a keystone species as you may, we may have in the plant world. Um, obviously, as I said, monarchs are obligates on it, but there's a lot of pollinators that use milkweed. Showy milkweed is our native milkweed species over most of Idaho. There's a couple other species that aren't quite as common. Um, and milkweed just provides benefits to a lot of different species. This paper came out fairly recently out of Eastern Washington showing over 125 species of invertebrates using showy milkweed. And it appeared that our native bees prefer showy milkweed even more than honeybees. So this is something that really could be beneficial to them. Um, so if you're looking to plant something, I would encourage you to consider putting some milkweed out there. Usually you can buy plugs or seeds at some of our native plant supply stores. The third project I'd like to highlight tonight, is called the Great Sunflower Project. Um, it's very simple in that you plant a lemon queen sunflower, wait for it to grow in bloom, and then document the pollinators that are coming to forge on it. This project is less about characterizing what species are present and more about characterizing pollinator services. So are pollinators out there coming into plants and doing the pollination chores that we need? It's great for gardeners. You get to plant and have a wonderful sunflower um, in your garden. Um, and it has a pretty limited amount of commitment in that you promise to survey three five minute periods at a minimum um, on your sunflower and record the data online. The data that you record is pretty straightforward. This is a copy of their data sheet. You can see you just record your location and time, uh, what your plant was, and then you report the data um, in just very basic categories of pollinators. Bumblebees, carpenter bees, honeybees, other bees, some birds and butterflies will also use these. Um, so you don't have to know a whole lot about uh, insect identification to be able to participate in that. And you can sit in your chair and look at your sunflower for five minutes and write things down. And this would be a contribution to what we know about the health of our pollinator communities. Okay, so the, the fourth project that I'd like to highlight, the one I'd like to spend the most time on is the one that runs my life these days, and that's the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. Uh, this project has a is a collaboration between the Xerxes Society, Idaho Fish and Game, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Agriculture, and actually in this newest edition, the, the Atlas through a separate effort will be expanding into California for the next couple of years. This work on the Atlas really spawned out of the Bumblebee Watch uh, program, which is a product of the Xerxes Society. They had a website where people could submit bumblebee observations. These are all the observations that were in that database from 2000 to 2017, which is the year just prior to a starting atlas. You can see that we got a lot of data around urban centers. You can see there's a little cluster there around Boise and Nampa, but also uh, in Portland and Seattle and Spokane, a lot of our bumblebee data was centered around high density areas of, of humans, urban areas. And we felt it was really important to even out our understanding of bumblebee distributions and where they were occurring across the whole Pacific Northwest. And so that was one of the initial goals of the project. So that's how we launched the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. There's, you can Google that name, it'll be very easy to find the website. 
and there's great directions there on how to participate. Essentially, you adopt a grid cell, you conduct surveys according to a fairly detailed protocol, but it's not too hard to get trained up on it, and I'll discuss that in a minute, and then you submit your data online. This is what that looked like. We actually just launched the Atlas effort for 2021 this week. So this just went live in the last day or two. Um, and this is where we will be focusing our priority efforts um, this year. You can see the, the greens, the dark green cells represent our highest priority areas that we're hoping to get people to re recruited to go out and conduct surveys. The light greens are st standard priority cells. Those were ones that we've sampled on previous years. So we do have some Mumblebee data from them. But if someone has a favorite camping spot or just that's the area they like to go, we'll still accept data from it. And then we've identified these high potential zones, which are the areas in bluish gray that in the past we've had observations of a variety of species that we call species of greatest conservation need. So those are ones that we have some conservation concern about them. And so we're encouraging people to go to those landscapes to confirm that those species still exist um, or still occur on that, in that area. The Atlas protocol is pretty straightforward. Um, once you adopt a cell, and cells are 50 kilometers on a side, so they're very large areas. Within that cell, you're free to find uh, a small two and a half acre minimum area, usually a meadow of flowers, someplace where there's abundant pollinator resources. And you spend 45 person minutes in there co collecting bees, capturing them and putting them in vials. Um, and how you do that, net a bee, um, transfer it into a vial, and then the, we chill those bees. And so all those bees are put temporarily on ice, and as their body temperature cools down, they go into torpor, and they stop moving around, and that allows you to pour them out of the vial, take some really nice pictures with them so that we can identify them, nice close-ups like there on the bottom left, um, and then put the bees uh, where they can warm up, back to ambient temperature, they'll wake back up and they will fly away, just kind of wondering what happened, but happy and healthy. And then you upload those pictures and your identification of those bees on the Bumblebee Watch org website, and you have contributed to the Atlas. We, to recruit people into this, we are running some training events. These just went up as well this week. So this is our current events calendar. This spring, we are going to have two online training events. One is a, a two-part series on May 17th and 19th, and the other is a half-day series on a Saturday, May 22nd. This will give you all the information you need to participate in the Atlas, from why you should participate, learning about bumblebee ecology, learning about our species of greatest conservation need, how to conduct your surveys, how to take great photographs, if you're interested in it, this is the way to get involved is to sign up for one of these training workshops. Those training workshops can be found on the Atlas website um, across the tabs under the top under resources. Then there's an events button. Click on that and it'll take you to where you can sign up for these. If for some reason those uh, training opportunities don't work for you, you have conflicts, we have pre-recorded those training opportunities from previous years. Um, and once you register uh, on the Pacific Northwest Atlas website, you'll be able to get into the training module such, section. And these are four videos that are a half hour to a full hour in length. that will give you all the skills you really need to know to start participating in this Atlas project. When you do upload your data, um, this is what it looks like on Bumblebee Watch. You upload up to three pictures of the bumblebees that you, a bumblebee that you, you caught and a tentative identification for it. And the real beauty behind this project is that we have an expert in the background that's reviewing all these photos and verifying your assigned identifications. 
So we're really, when it comes down to it, you don't have to know anything about bumblebees in particular or be an expert to participate in this project. All you need to be able to do is faithfully execute the protocol and be, take conscientious, very good, clear pictures and upload it. And that's all we ask. We'll take care of all the ID and take it from there. So far, this project has, the response of citizens to this project has been amazing. Over the first three years of the project, between 2018 and 2020, uh, volunteers conducted over 1,000 surveys for bumblebees, recorded over 20,000 observations of bumblebees, for over 10,000 volunteer hours and 100,000 volunteer miles driven. It, the, it, the response has been nothing short of amazing. And back in the day when we used to do in-person trainings, which hopefully we may get back to next year, this is, these are what the rooms look like with people just wanting to learn about bumblebees and how they can participate. And that has resulted in a marked change in what we know about our bumblebee species and their distributions. If you remember earlier, I showed you this slide of the bumblebee watch data from 2000 to 2017. That's the panel there on the left. Well, add three more years of data on that for the atlas and look at the number of dots that have been generated. Those are volunteer efforts by citizen scientists around the four states documenting what we have for bumblebees and the health of our bumblebee populations. And as an example, one of our species of greatest conservation need is the, the western bumblebee. Um, you can see our 17 years of data there on the left um, with a scattering of green dots and then when we add on an additional three years of data from the creation of the atlas, we can see we picked up a lot more observations of that species, particularly in Idaho, northern Idaho and northeast Washington as well. So those covers the, the four great pollinator projects that people can get involved with. Um, in conclusion, just like to say there's a place for you in citizen science if you want to, if you're three year old like that person on my little girl on the left, or if you're a few more years than three year old, that person on the right, um, there are definitely opportunities to get involved. Um, and there's all those websites that I mentioned in tonight's talk. Um, the, and if you're particularly interested in the Atlas, there's my email address. If you'd like to reach out and talk about that some more, I'd be happy to talk with you all. And with that, I thank you for your time. Looks like we're still viewing your screen there. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to shut that off. Um, I won't see it. Stop share, pause share. There it is, sorry for the, got it. You're good, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Joel, for sh sharing these great citizen science projects. It's really inspiring to see how big of an effect each of us can have on pollinator conservation when we all contribute. It's also really nice to know that you don't have to be an expert to participate. Um, that's always kind of daunting. Um, so thank you so much. Okay, let's see. Our next speaker is Melanie Kirby. Mel Melanie has been keeping bees professionally for 24 years, first starting as a US Peace Corps volunteer stationed in South America. Since then, she has learned from bees and their keepers across the states in the globe collaborating on sustainable beekeeping programs and promoting regenerative pollinator biodiversity projects. In addition to breeding regionally adapted bees in the Rocky Mountains through her farm Zia Queen Bees, she is also a researcher, writer, artist, and serves as the extension educator for the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So welcome Melanie. Uh, please begin whenever you're ready. Sure. Hi, thanks for having me. Let me see if I can start my video. Um, I don't see myself, but I see everybody. <laughs> Let me Why see. If it'll... <laughs> yeah, there we go. Hi, <laughs> my um, it's been super, super windy here and I'm, I'm in Santa Fe right now. So it's crazy winds. And so I just switched to my um, 
hotspot, which is a better connection because before it was a little bit glitchy. So thanks for bearing with me, but very nice to be with you all. And yeah, so I'm, I'm in the home stretch of my master's in science and entomology. And so um, from Washington State University. And so I have my final exam on May 14th, which is super exciting. Um, and and um, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a roller coaster. And I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen because it'll kind of um, share a little bit more about my story, but I really appreciate um, being invited to, to come and interact with you all and looking forward to our conversation. So let me do share screen here. And of course it's like, which one is it? <laughs> Hold on one second, because I don't want to pick the wrong. I had two, because my internet got really glitchy, I didn't want to um, risk it shutting down. And so I, I ended up, so I was normally, I was actually planning on doing an ArcGIS story maps, which is kind of a new format for me, but I've started to really enjoy working with it. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, to do that with you all, but because my internet's a little bit glitchy, I switched to a PowerPoint, but I do have the other link so that you can see it at your leisure afterwards too, because it's, it's via the web. And so if the, if the connection's slow, it might be a little glitchy, but okay, let me try again to do share screen. There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to start off with a little video. Um, let me know if you guys can see this and I'm going to actually switch it to slideshow because it's probably showing the slide sorter. Yep. It looks like I can see, I can see your okay. screen. Cool. Um, let me see if I can move up the control panel is up top so it's hard for me. I'm trying to see where I can get to slideshow. <laughs> um, let me go here first and then see if I can do it to slideshow. Goodness, I didn't realize I was going to be so glitchy. I'm so sorry. Um, come on. Let me, um, let me do stop share one more time. Sorry. And let me see if I can start it and then it'll, there we go. Slideshow from beginning. There we go. Now let me see if I can share my screen. No, it still wants to show me all this. But I think it's slideshow. There's um, on the left. It says from beginning. I think you might. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Traveled many a bumpy road in the darkest of nights, serving as a chauffeur to beings of sweet starlight. I migrate with them like a shepherd, roaming with my flock of winged midwives, as a fellow follower of the bloom, a self-proclaimed nectar nomad. I was introduced to this artistic science of beekeeping two decades ago as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer collaborating with peasant farmers in South America. The bees captivated my curious mind and working in an outdoor office made of fresh air, flowers, and freedom enticed my soul. My nomadic journey as an apiculturist has taken me far from where I could ever have imagined, having come from a humble home in Pueblo Indian country in New Mexico. My heritage is a mosaic of cellular memories influenced by my Native American ancestors who instilled in me a profound reverence for place and purpose, and to pursue acts of community service. So I chose to become a bee farmer as I wanted to continue to learn from Mother Nature and Father Time. As a farmer, I share beekeepers' voices of concern and need for adaptation and innovation to fulfill our dedication for local to global food production. Sharing their challenges, I became encouraged to return to academia to help quantify their observations and advocate for pollinator conservation. Now as a researcher, my quest to better understand the relationship between cultures, food systems, and stewardship is at the forefront of my thoughts. Honeybees are like some of us and our ancestors, immigrants to this country. They have adapted and become the backbone of agriculture. There are distinct ecotypes or subspecies of honeybees like races and humans. And these ecotypes carry genetic histories like seas, which contain their very existence and memories of creation. 
For within each one, they have the power to nurture and adapt and the magnificence to create life, food, and medicine for the world. One of the things I most enjoy about beekeeping is that it bridges cultures and goes beyond borders. It connects us to our origins as fellow beings of light, as a part of this land, not separate from it. This magnificence is alluring and inspires me to find and connect with bees and their keepers around the globe. I invite you all to accompany me on my Nectar Nomad storytelling journey as I chase the bloom, encounter cultures, and follow the liquid starlight known as honey from flora to flavor to feast. Cool. So, um, yeah, that's me in three minutes and five seconds. <laughs> and I, I took this little digital storytelling workshop this past summer and um, came up with that as an introduction. And I, I've been really um, using it to introduce myself to people because it's so hard to kind of condense one's life story, right, <laughs> into a short amount of time. But um, I had no idea that bees would end up taking me around the world, and I've had the really blessed opportunities to travel to numerous different countries, and I'll talk about some of them later on. And, and it's extremely humbling because what I end up learning is that, you know, one, bees are, are pretty distinct. Um, wherever you go, there's some similarities, and same with the cultures that interact with them, right? And so it's, um, it's become a real passion of mine um, and to incorporate it in with storytelling to better understand the ethnobotanical origin of things, their uses of plants, but also how it connects to um, bee husbandry and into food systems and, and food as medicine, right? Um, which brings me to this next slide I'd like to share with you all. So um, ecosystem services, and some of this I'm sure is very elementary for folks, but I just like to give a little sort of um, uh, connection slide into into where we're going with this conversation um, and looking at what is this importance of place power and purpose and for me power actually stands more for responsibility right so what is our responsibility when we um, recognize that we are a part of nature and that we are in this continuum of, of various cycles and in these various ecosystem services our you know, being in this Anthropocene era or this man sort of impacted era, um, humankind impacted era, you know, what is it that we are altering or affecting when it comes to these ecosystem services? And so there's, as you can see, there's a lot of different ones, but pollination is, is listed right here as one of them. Um, and this connects up to the agroecosystem and, and also what I like to call the, the atmosphere. You know, we have the biosphere, but I call it the atmosphere. For those who aren't familiar, Api um, means bee in Latin. So when we talk about apiculture, um, that means it's the study of bees. And one of the things I'd like to share with folks too is we tend to think of, you know, when we think of pollinators, we think of the poster child, right, which are honeybees. And we, we, you know, we think of them because of the fact that they make honey, but they've also been sadly exploited creature, right, because they have um, been used to to become one of the what we call the backbone of American agriculture and, and their pollination pollination services are, are in the you know billions of dollars. Um, and just like Joel was sharing, you know, what are those what are those foods that we have in the grocery store with pollinators and what does it look like without those services? And so um, one of the things I like to share is that we tend to think of honeybees as being exotics or being you know introduced by colonizers. To North America, but there there are cousins to honeybees that were actually here pre-contact, and there's fossil evidence of what's called Apis mellifera nearctica that was found in Nevada. Um, that's over 14 million years old, and so like horses, they were here before, um, and then there was an ice age, and things changed, and things were lost, and then I, you know now flash forward to now. So I like to consider. Um, horses and honeybees as, as, you know, being cousins to their ancestors that were here before and that they're reintroduced. Um, and so this agroecosystem that we've created, you know, whether it's, you know, 
outside of the city limits or up in wildlands. And actually this picture over here with some hives, these are some of my mating nucleus hives where the, that are rearing new queen mamas. I have a better picture of that mountain coming up that I'll show you all. So this is actually um, my farm partner, Mark Spitzig. He's from Upper Michigan, um, <laughs> from the UP, um, in Florida. And after I did Peace Corps, I actually went and one of my really good friends was from Hawaii and I ended up working um, out there. I'm working on her mom's farm for a little bit and then found out that there were several large-scale queen rearing operations making our equipment um, in the jungles of South America as a Peace Corps volunteer using a machete, you know, no power tools, to all this sort of sudden factory farming USA. Um, but it really opened my eyes to this broader industry of apiculture or, you know, American beekeeping and um, just how integrated it is into so many different facets of our food system. But this is, um, these are kind of my home stomping grounds. This is one picture of my home stomping grounds up here. Um, had my farm in, I grew up in Southern New Mexico. That's where my tribal community is located. But for five hours north actually is um, what we call the, the high road to Taos. And so I lived up here for 11 years. This is where I had my farm um, for, the past 11 years, and then we just moved it right down the road to a community called the Dito, um, which I'll show you that peak in that next picture. But as mentioned, I'm, I'm finishing my graduate work um, at Washington State University, which is in Pullman, Washington, and it's right next to Moscow, Idaho. And so I, um, Idaho is a very, has a very fun place in my heart because I would drive through it on my way to back to my bee farm <laughs> numerous times a year. So this is that image, it's not the best, but this is this other peak now in Vedito. So we're, we're still located at about 8,000 foot elevation between 7,500, actually 7,800 to 8,300 foot elevation, um, which is my home breeding grounds. But within 20, 25 minutes, it drops um, 3,000 feet to the Northern Rio Grande Valley, which has a lot of fruit orchards. So the landscape actually topographically does have some similarities to Idaho with the basalt and the high plains um, and uh, some of the prairies. So New Mexico is known for where the mountains and the desert, where the desert and the plains meet the mountains. This here is a picture of Pullman, Washington. Um, so the Palouse for those who aren't familiar. And so being able to work with these even stateside in these various locations from, you know, New Mexico to Hawaii to Michigan to Florida, where I met my farm partner working for another beekeeper, to then all of a sudden Eastern Washington and even into California. Um, that also has opened my eyes to just the what we call the epigenetics of of bee husbandry. And for those who aren't familiar, there's genetics, right, which are just the effects of those genetics. And so, um, you know, depending on where an organism lives, whether it's a human or a plant or an animal, another animal, um, you know, different genes will be turned on or off um, as they are, as they are impacted by the environment. So here's a picture of Moscow, Idaho. And um, you can't tell yet, I'm a big fan of mountains, so I like having mountains around me. Um, this is a really pretty picture, and so I, I would spend a lot of time um, in this intermountain region, and so I just kind of wanted to pull up a map here to show you all, you know, how this, um, how this plays out. I mean, the Rocky Mountains, of course, are up here, you know, in Canada, and, and traverse all the way down here into what we call the Southern Rockies, which comes all the way actually down into Southern New Mexico. So, my farm is right up here, really close to the Colorado border. Um, but as you can see, we've got such what you call a crenulated landscape, right? So there's microclimates around every corner um, and, and it makes it a very dynamic enterprise when you're trying to do any type of farming or even uh, pollinator <laughs> conservation work. Um, within New Mexico, we have seven out of eight climactic zones. We have everything from desert to tundra. Um, and we have a variety of plant hardiness zones too, um, which makes it um, pretty tricky, I like to say. You know, it's, it's, we're known as the land of enchantment. 
we're also known as the land of entrapment. <laughs> um, and sometimes the, the landscape loves you or sometimes it spits you out, right? But um, having been born and raised here and then lived in other, having lived in other places too, there's, I really like the um, diversity of landscape that we have here. And so I mentioned this in that within my own beekeeping, I do a, a little 60 mile migratory loop between the lowlands and the highlands, trying to capture different flows, that, hence the name Nectar Nomad, where I'm, I'm following these blooms. So like, you know, one would do with their sheep and, and um, taking in their flock, you know, from different landscapes to get them the food they need. So um, here's a few shots of our area. This is actually the Hemis Mountain Range. This is all part of the Southern Rockies as well um, in the upper left. And actually early bloom, which is going on now, time of the year, um, we tend to get late frosts. And um, so I've, I've learned to really curb my enthusiasm because I get excited for spring, but we can get snow. I think the latest I've seen snow here in northern New Mexico has been June 14th. Um, the locals will say, you know, don't put anything outside until after Mother's Day. Um, and that's Sorry to interrupt. Um, it looks like your Can you guys hear me? I'm I'm back now. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. It was it kind oh, of froze and then you cut out a little bit and um yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if you could hear I'm, me. I'm telling you the wind is something atrocious today. I'm so sorry. Well, I'll I'll speed it along. Let me see if I can share screen again. Um and yeah, here we go. Can you guys can you see this? Yes. Okay, cool. So, hopefully you heard me talking about the varying climate <laughs> and microclimates that we have here in New Mexico um, and in this whole intermountain region, which makes it a pretty dynamic place for, um, for pollinator conservation and stewardship and also beekeeping in general. Um, and so uh, these are just a few different shots where there's no compromise, obviously, because of this uh, labellas up here that's taken in Rio de Janeiro. So, um, but then there's also some pretty barren ones too, right? And then you have you know, big agriculture, some of it monocrop, some of it not, or you have a mix of wildlands and, um, and uh, urban lands too. Um, so we are what we eat, right? And we eat what sustains us. And the word pharmacy is actually rooted in an Egyptian word, which means the art of making magic. Um, and it really does all come down to this flower power, right? Whether it's food for us, which bears fruit, or it's food for the pollinators, which help to, you know, I call them these, these um, ballerinas that help to do this cyclical dance year after year um, to help these flowers do, do their own reproduction, right? Or to follow through with their own reproduction. But all of this combines together. And I know this schematic isn't very good. This is actually from my Peace Corps manual from years ago, but I really like it. Um, you know, you've got weather, you've got it impacting plants, and then there'll be a nectar flow. And then there's what you call the honey flow. And the nectar flow is actually pretty immense. There's a lot of nectar, but with shifting climate, um, plants are smart. You know, they're not going to be pumping out nectar when it's really hot or if they don't have the resources to do it. So even the nutrition they're providing is changing over time, depending on this, the environmental effects of the weather. So I showed this photo before, and I want, I don't know if you guys caught this, this is spring up here in the Hemes, um, fruit bloom. We've got summer, I love this because it's just a double rainbow shot on some of my hives up on, the, um, up on the high road. And then of course some fall shots, and then winter, which this is Zapata, which 
um, you know, tierra o muerte, for those of you who understand Spanish, that means land or death, right? If we don't take care of our land, then we're not going to survive. And so I think that's a pretty poignant um, quote from, um, from a renegade, so to speak. Um, but the, whatever can survive in these varying microclimates and in these, this, very, this diverse and tough climate within the Intermountain region is, is pretty special. And um, I, I consider myself to be a seed saver where the bees are the seeds. And so finding those strains that can do well and that can, um, that can perpetuate themselves are really worth um, conserving and also sharing, right? And so bees are, are like seeds. They rely on mother nature and our stewardship. They offer the exchange of pollen for life and they develop over time. So their genetic stories are unlocked and the ability for them to endure is actually becomes a heritable trait. So for those who are, are or are not familiar with genetics, I mean, heritability is really important because it's something that can be passed on to the next generation. But if we alter their food resources, right? And if we alter this nutrition within the landscape, whether it's from man um, impacted landscape scenarios or even shifting climate, which is also impacted by us, um, there's a lot of things we just don't know, you know? And GMO, these, I'm, I'm not trying to persuade anybody to take a particular stance. I'm just bringing these up as things that we still need to um, research and understand. And genetically modified is actually a pretty broad term. You know, even old style plant breeding and land race strains, even these ancient cultures that would specifically crossbreed certain plants or save them, that's still considered genetically modified, but it's genetically engineered GE, which is a totally different thing where we're starting to splice and dice different you know, organisms, um, DNA material from various organisms together. And that's a whole other type of scenario. But all of these things are things that we should really consider um, and, and wonder what that trickle down effect is gonna be on all these other organisms. So the obstacles we know are increasing. Um, we're already in super drought conditions here in New Mexico. Um, I think farmers in Albuquerque were saying they're only gonna get three doses of water, of irrigation water, and who knows how long it's going to be. It used to be by acre feet, sometimes now it's just by the minute, and so um, we'll see what this year actually actually brings. Um, but all of these affect the microbial populations, and so the diet, antibiotics, pesticides, wax contaminants, all these things um, really do affect bee health, and not just honeybees, but all, all bees in general. Um, to a certain degree because they're all related, right? So when there's um, issues with the microbes and it causes nutritional deficiencies, they can become more susceptible to different diseases and viruses. Um, there's what you call supersedure of queens, which means they get replaced or you, you lose these, these genetics because they're not able to adapt or endure and um, overall longevity is diminished. So this is a really cool schematic by Dr. Diana Samatar. She's now retired. Um, but she used to be at the USDA B Lab, Carl B. Hayden B Lab in Arizona. And um, interestingly, you know, it's the, these plants, this flower power, right? They're providing medicine. So there's lactic bacteria within, lactic acid bacteria within the honey stomach, but there's also um, particular chemical components that are coming off of the nectars themselves, which is uh, like raspberries, for instance, it's more like um, hydrogen peroxide. And so all of these combined, that's what makes honey sort of a, an infinite shelf life. It doesn't go bad because it actually um, cannot grow bacteria in it. But when we compromise all these things, you know, it's really going to affect all the health, right? And so this is actually feedlot in California, just to kind of show the difference here. I don't want to run out of time, so um, try and move it along. And um, this actually, this slide I put together Gosh, I want to say almost a decade ago. Little did I know at the time that like solar arrays now are really becoming a big hot um, sort of location for beekeepers because they're working with these solar companies. You know, it's like you already have all these panels out. Why not also plant a bunch of pollinator forage underneath, right? So you can have a dual purpose, right? And we have this technology now where we can do things responsibly and also really reconcile this compromise, it doesn't have to be like those favelas, it doesn't have to be strictly, you know, concrete jungle or completely wild, we can have these blended landscapes that can provide um, a symbiotic relationship for all those involved. 
So it does take a community to do this, especially with pollinators because they fly to eat, right? Um, some of them fly really far, some of them don't fly so far, but they all need this food and it really does require the sharing of education between farmers, researchers, institutions, and you know, community members and organizations. So here's just a few shots. I, I do a lot of um, bee breeding exchanges. Like I said, you know, as a seed saver, sharing these seeds, or these bees as seeds with beekeepers in different places, um, trying to find ones that are naturally uh, hardy and resistant and resilient. Um, and I select for longevity. So it's, it's a pretty intense record keeping process, but it, it's something that I'm, I'm on a mission to try and help encourage more beekeepers to do. Um, and honeybees are, of course, not the only bee, right? So, so there's over 20,000, you know, globally that we know of. Um, there's over 4,000 that are in North America. And in the Intermountain region, in New Mexico in particular, we have close to 2,000 of those 4,000 different kinds here. And so honeybees, as this poster child, really sort of open our, our perception up to this broader world of, of pollinator, um, you know, universe in terms of all the different kinds. But being able to provide for all of these various organisms is pretty important. Um, there's a lot of different uh, approaches to it. You know, the bottom sort of little bee block nest there, I know those are pretty popular. Um, I would always encourage people to check with their extension agents and how, how to really best apply it. But there are, you know, sometimes those, those look cool, but they can also be a cesspool for diseases because if one of those tubes gets a particular mite or a virus, then it can spread to all those other little bees all compact there. So there's, there's particular ways to do it now with straws and what have you. And I believe um, for Idaho area, I know Washington has crown bees, which really focuses a lot on their specific strains of mason bees for their area. But um, for Idaho, I'm sure there's, there's a resource. Um, so biomimicry, which means just following nature's lead, you know, what is it that we can do if, if we know that botany is medicine and there's this flower power um, and that it can, you know, really bring on the nutrition and we can have these healthy organisms and then have healthy products. And this really does all revolve around community. Um, and whether or not we have the organic reality, this is sort of a slide I share with folks because people think, you know, well, I'm not going to do anything with my bees, but you know, there's a lot of different paths to that. And since bees fly, you can't really guarantee that they're not gonna get into something that somebody sprayed or, or what have you. So it really does involve the community, the community more, than we, more than we realize. Um, and then depending on the weather, the plants and the forage and the nutrition they get, and whether or not they're able to tap into that nectar flow and turn it into honey. So some years are good, some are not so good. Um, this is this is my farm up in Chuchis. Um, and I don't own land, so I share I share my bees with various community members who need pollination. And so in that sense, I really rely on community to share their space. But um, this is sort of a just to go over a few things, you know, when you have when you have that camaraderie, you have these relationships, then you're able to share this food as medicine and and you know, harvest what's extra to then share with your community. So whether it's honey or we also do some lip balm, um, you know, honey has over 21 essential amino acids. It's more readily digested. Um, it's used a lot in actual veterinary um, uh, applications, sorry, for um, everything from horses to sea turtles. Um, so it's, it really can, can provide a lot of medicinal relief. Wax is actually their sweat. So it's, um, it binds with um, lipids, so anytime bees come into contact with a pesticide and then if they sweat out wax, it's gonna end up in the wax. So when you're putting on lip balm or you're using it for different craft products or making candles, like if, if those bees have been exposed to some type of contaminant, it's gonna be in their wax. And so we can really be exposed to this as well without even knowing. Um, pollen and propolis, I love this photo shot. I use it as my little profile pic. I just love all the different colors of the pollen there because you can see how, how much different nutrition they're getting. Um, and I like to see that, that they're getting diverse nutrition. It's not just one kind of pollen um, because all of these various po pollens will have different nutritional factors and different proteins and enzymes that they're sort of bringing to the, to the bee's pantry, right? Propolis is actually resin that's collected from trees and shrubs and it's um, highly antimicrobial, antibiotic, antifungal. 
Um, various cultures use it in different ways, but um, it, it's also a medicinal product. Very strong, so you have to be really careful with it. And then, of course, royal jelly, which is the bee's first food. Um, all bees get it for the first uh, few days of being a larva, and then the diet switches. So if it's going to be a queen bee, they will keep feeding her royal jelly, um, which is what makes her live for years versus weeks, um, like uh, you know her sisters. And then um, drones and worker bees, which are the other female bees, will be will switch the diet to bee bread, which is pollen and, and um, honey mix. There's also apotherapy, so the use of high products for health and wellness. Um, there's something called Hoshin Do, which is a Japanese version. There's actually an institute here in Santa Fe for it. But um, the States, is a, we're a little bit behind on a lot of these um, different applications. But a lot of other countries are really advanced and have a lot of research, scientific peer-reviewed research on various applications of hive products. So um, we're, we're starting to, to dabble in that um, state side, but I hope to see more research coming out. So that's what I had to show for you all for today. Um, and I look forward to questions at the end, but I will share this link in the chat because I know I'm gonna run out of time. And um, since my internet was glitchy, I didn't want to rely on the web-based version that I have for you all. So I'll put this link in the chat for this um, ArcGIS story maps that really talks a little bit more about some of the travels that I've done and um, working with, with bees and their keepers in varying places in terms of expanding your worldview. So thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we actually got our first two hives last week on our farm, um, and we're really excited to be starting our um, journey as beekeepers. So very excited. Awesome. Also, I had well, no- The Treasure idea. Valley beekeepers are, are a good group. I know a few of the folks in that, in that network, so- We joined, that, we joined the club, so. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, also, I had no idea that bees could sweat. That was a, an amazing fact. <laughs> Right, right. Well, and one other quite little fact that I'll share with you is there's, you know, within the honeybee species, they're, they're one of 20,000 different kinds of bees, right? Within just honeybees, there's 30 different kinds of recognized um, subspecies or ecotypes, right? So some are good for warm weather, some for cold weather, but they're just like races in humans. You know, we're all humans, but we're different races of humans. And so same with, same with honeybees, which is pretty interesting. Wow, yeah, that is definitely cool. Thank you so much. All right, so our final speaker tonight is Katrina Blair. Katrina began studying wild plants in her teens when she camped out alone for a summer to embrace a wild foods diet. She later wrote The Wild, Edible, and Medicinal Plants of the San Juan Mountains for her senior project at Colorado College. She completed an, uh, an MA at John F. Kennedy University in Orinda, California in holistic health education. She founded Turtle Lake Refuge in 1998, a nonprofit whose mission is to celebrate the connection between personal health and wild lands. Turtle Lake Refuge includes a wild local living foods cafe, sustainable education center, and community farm. Katrina teaches permaculture and wild edible and medicinal classes locally and globally. She is the author of several books, including Local Wildlife, Turtle Lake Refuge's Recipes for Living Deep, and The Wild Wisdom of Weeds, 13 Essential Plants for Human Survival. So welcome, Katrina. Um, go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here. And I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, we'll just, uh, yeah. Is it happening? Let's see. Yep, it looks like it's loading Great. up right now. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and get started. But um, yeah, I fell in love with wild plants when I was a, a kid. I grew up here in Durango, Colorado. And when I was 11, I, got in, I was with my family and we were all picnicking over at this mountain lake. And I was in, uh, on an air mattress just paddling on the, on the lake. And my brother and cousins all went back to have lunch. And I just kept paddling and then it was these plants on the far end of the shore where right? I paddled all the way out of sight and around the corner and these plants beckoned me over. And as I crawled through the muck and then sat down in these plants, I got totally overwhelmed and euphoric with 
this energy of the plants basically said, you're home and you're going to live your life with us. And it was the biggest high I'd ever experienced. And after that point, I just wanted to learn everything I could about the wild plants. And I found myself continuing on this journey of learning. And uh, that took me um, into my college years of, of being a biologist and getting to do these independent studies where I'd go to the woods and learn about the wild plants and write a paper. I did several of these month long independent studies. And then one, one summer, just after high school, I camped out for an, a summer just to eat the wild edible foods and learn as much as I could. And I had a lot of books with me and I would experiment and test. And, and it was just a really profound time of just being alone in the wild, really connecting with the plants and, and uh, continuing to learn. So my, my life's journey has been a constant learning and I still every year take a long walkabout like a week to 10 days where I often don't bring food with me and I just um, start walking. And it's been actually tied in with the Mushroom Festival where I go, it's about a hundred miles from Durango to Telluride and I'll end up walking there. And again, just continuing to keep learning how much um, these plants have to share on the subtle and potent levels. So today's presentation is about the weeds and how much bees love weeds. And so it's about 13 plants that the bees um, will end up utilizing for their forage all around the world. And so I'll just go ahead and move on to these different slides. I will try to. Okay, I'm not being able to. <laughs> Wondering if, oh, I just did it. Okay. so. Uh, Turtle Lake Refuge is a nonprofit that I helped start about 22 years ago, and our mission is to celebrate the connection between our personal health and the wild lands. And we have a wild food lunch that um, we, ser we serve every Tuesday and Friday, Turtle Tuesday and Frog Friday, from 1111 to 222. And it's an educational lunch where we're harvesting these wild plants, the dandelion and the dock and lamb's quarter and wild berries that we harvest and the acorns. And then we integrate it into this meal that we have as a community meal two times a week, all year round. And we've been serving these wild food lunches for now 22 years, <laughs> pretty amazing, actually 23 years. So our mission though is um, not only just about educating people about the wild plants, but um, we have a project called uh, <laughs> called Be Happy Lands, and it's showing how actually the wild plants, the wild weeds, are so important for regenerating the disturbance that humans create. So here's just a picture of a dandelion and a mallow and a plantain, some of these wild plants that will show up where there's disturbed ground. And it's pretty powerful because these wild plants do so many levels of service. They're, they're having deep tap roots, so that helps break up compacted soil, and they pull up minerals from deep within the soil, bring them into their green leaves, and then year after year, they compost these green leaves and create more topsoil. So all of these plants are perennials, and perennial plants have a, a really deep connection with their place because year after year, their root systems gets more involved with the soil microorganisms. And I mean, it's a huge community underground. And not only do these plants regenerate the earth to greater fertility and stability, which allows the next succession species to come in, but they also provide incredible food and medicine for humans. So these are plants that provide our bodies with more nutrition than anything we could buy in the supermarket. It's incredible how much more calcium we get from eating a dandelion or how much um, mallow, you know, will support our body's nutrition as well as a medicinal quality of decongesting or plantain is an amazing first aid kit. So then in addition to feeding and being medicine for the human race, these wild plants act as an incredible forage for the wild pollinators and the honeybees. And they grow in cracks and sidewalks and disturbed areas that um, when our world is getting so paved over, 
and so built up, it's incredible that we have these wild plants tucked in and among, amongst our living situation. So yeah, these plants are so essential for the bees. And I'm a beekeeper also, and have been for over 20 years, and just have been watching how, you know, it's the, some of the dandelions or some of the first flowers to pop up that the bees really utilize for their early spring nectar. And then mallow is another one of these plants that is still flowering in November. And, you know, the bees are using that as one of the later plants. And many of the, you know, the landscaping varieties that people plant are wonderful, but they might not have as long of a time frame. And, um, you know, these wild weeds don't need tending from us. They just provide an incredible source of nutrition and forage for the bees. So that's been a big, a big focus because um, as a beekeeper and someone who's in love with the wild plants, I'm just noticing how it's the weeds that are so beneficial to the bees. And so, and whether it's, you know, they're using it as an umbrella, this I took in a rainstorm. And so the bees are all tucked in underneath the flowers <laughs> just to keep out of the rain. But one interesting thing in my journey is that I, lived next door to the herbicide sprayer of my town for the last 20 years. And they um, would spray all the city parks and the county roads. And I took this picture right next to this preschool, you know, and it's just one of those, wow, big tragedies of our society where we're not even making sense. We're not doing what makes common sense, you know, of putting a real toxic down right at the entrance of our schools or putting toxic spray on top of the forage that the bees that are taking in. So that's been a constant journey for me of navigating, one, having these herbicides stored right next to my organic gardens and my bees, and working with our city to create organic parks. And so there's so many ways that, that because I had these wonderful neighbors, <laughs> um, it really motivated me to do my life's work, which is some of the things would be to write this book about the wild wisdom of weeds so that yes, I don't want these herbicides in my backyard, but I don't want them in anyone's backyard. So how can we as a whole culture of humans across the globe start shifting away from these practices and realizing how valuable these wild plants are in navigating our human disturbance? You know, it's nature who's sending out these beautiful wild plants as the frontline activists to deal with our compaction and our disturbance of the soil and our construction. You know, it's, it's um, ironic that we're trying to get rid of the very plants that are the problem solvers anyway. So that's fun to start looking bigger. Um, and one of the ways that um, we've shown different ways to change our city's practices is we've encouraged our city of Durango to create organic parks and that has happened and it's been a long journey it's definitely um, hasn't been easy it's been over you know 12 plus years but now our town has about a third of the parks are navigate are managed organically which means without herbicides and without chemical fertilizers and through Turtle Lake Refuge, our nonprofit, we have an organic weed mitigation project that I mentioned before called Be Happy Lands. And so we, instead of using any kind of chemicals, we use compost tea and we inoculate the ground with a mycelium and microorganism to build the fertility and stability of the soil. And then we're manually harvesting these wild plants and seeding with other native grasses and other flowering species that the landowner would like. And this has been a very successful project. It's um, well into its, you know, seven, eight years. And many other towns around the Southwest Colorado have hired us, including Telluride and Ophir and Mancus to manage their wild places also and their parks. So it's been a fun journey of realizing we can make a difference. And actually what's amazing is that my neighbors, they sold their business three years ago and we were able to acquire that additional land, two acres next door. And we've been completely remediating it with mushrooms and microorganisms and compost tea. When we first tested it, it was very toxic, having been chronically sprayed for so many years. 
But now after so much dedicated effort, we tested it again last fall and again this spring and the residues are so small that we're actually able to grow food on the third year after our work. So that's a huge success. So I'm gonna just go and speak a little bit about these 13 plants that are so beneficial for humans, the earth and our pollinator friends. So dandelion. Um, dandelions are so delicious and you can eat the entire plant, the, the roots, the leaves, the greens, the stem and even the flower and the seeds actually. The whole of the dandelion is a wonderful food. A little bitter, little sweet puts you in the mood. Make your coffee from the roasted root and make sweet music from the singing flute. So dandelion is an amazing instrument and powerhouse of nutrition. And we host a dandelion festival every year on and the first weekend in May. And so this year it'll be May 1st. And it's a wonderful festival that uh, we actually harvest 20 pounds of dandelions and we give it to our local brewery and they make a dandelion beer for the event. And we have local music and food and a maypole dance. And it's a whole celebration on organic land stewardship and celebrating the organic parks of Durango. So if you ever get, to come, get a chance, please come join us on May 1st on Saturday. And so then the next plant I want to talk about is mallow. Mallow is good for your skin. It's slimy and demulsifying. Grind the whole plant into a goo. It makes fabulous lotion and shampoo. So mallow is a delicious food and you can eat these little cheese wheel fruits that you see on the slide as well as all the greens. We put the roots into our ice cream that we make and um, I use the greens and lots of recipes, but the whole plant is edible. And again, it's these flowers that are some of the latest pollinating flowers that I've seen the bees on when nothing else is still around. These are some wild breadsticks made with the, the mallow and we dehydrate them both with solar dehydrators and um, have a lot of fun with creating all sorts of fun recipes with these wild foods. So the third plant I wanna introduce you to is curly dock or yellow dock. Eat your dock greens when they're tender and sour and grind the seeds to make your own flour. So this is another amazing food and medicine plant, both the greens when they're young and the seeds after they go into the fall. And I love to grind the seeds into this delicious bread. It's a wild buckwheat. And so it makes an amazing bread that I mix part buckwheat, part wild dock and sometimes other other grains like oats to make a wonderful um, bread. And so don't be afraid of the prickle of the thistle. Drink down the juice. It'll make you want to whistle. And thistle is just one of those plants that has so much benefit to, um, well, definitely the bees and many wild animals like the deer and so many birds eat the seeds. And I love to juice the thistles and we use the roots to make a chai tea. And these flower neck, um, have so much sweet nectar in them. I love when I'm out in the garden, I'll just pick a little head of those pink flowers and put them in my mouth and it makes a delicious chewing gum and cleans your teeth at the same time. And so thistles are one of those plants that most landowners, well, they don't want on their land, but also legally, it's uh, illegal. It's interesting, I live in Colorado and marijuana is completely legal to grow here, but wild thistle is still illegal to grow on your land. So unfortunately, the laws are a little bit of the out there. I think of them as um, outdated or kind of small thinking. It's not the big picture of, wow, how these plants are really the heroes of our time, helping remediate our disturbance. Because the thistles are one of the best forage for the bees. I mean, there's when we're going out into a field and we're manually harvesting these wild thistle plants for different landowners, it's, there's thousands and thousands of bees all over these thistle flowers. And so it's just really good to remember that there's so much more to the picture than sometimes we realize. And so the thistle is one of those really important plants. And it's so alkalinizing. So I'll gather these green leaves, put them into my blender. We have a bicycle blender that we make with um, a lot of kids' help, and then 
strain out the juice and it makes this delicious green juice that I love to drink on a daily basis. And this thistle green juice is very alkalinizing for the body. So it helps detoxify and you know, if we get too acidic, that's often when we get depressed or get low energy or we start to have symptoms anywhere from the common cold all the way to cancer, depending on what's going on in our body. But when we drink an alkaline fresh juice, that's like a green juice, it's incredible how our body starts to regenerate itself and heal anything that's going off. So the thistle is one of those amazing plants that can really support our health by just drinking it in a juice. And luckily there's a lot of it sometimes in places and it's free. <laughs> so it's a fabulous resource for humans. So plantain, if you need a first aid kit, plantain leaves and seeds are it. Chew the leaves into a mash. It helps with bites and stings and rash. And so plantain is a plant that I love to teach kids to, um, kids about right away. If they ever get stung by a bee or get a mosquito bite or a spider bite or snake bite, um, or even just get an infection, actually it's those plantain chewed Ash, put on like a little poultice and it draws out the toxins or the pain or the swelling right away. And so it's also an edible food. I love to eat those seeds and I love to drink the greens or eat them in my salad. Then there's amaranth and amaranth is packed with protein, the seeds and the greens. And I love to eat the greens kind of like spinach. And then if you let the plant go to seed, these tiny little black seeds are so potent and we use them in lots of our recipes with turtle lake refuge we not only serve this wild food lunch but we make all kinds of wild food treats like amaranth flaxseed crackers and we put the amaranth in our granola and it's just one of those high protein plants that people call pigweed you know it's got a lot of weedy names but it's one of the great foods for humanity and then there's purslane, which is juicy and pretty, grows in the cracks of every single city. And this is a succulent, delicious plant that can be made into all kinds of recipes, from desserts to soups or just eaten in a salad. And the seeds are tiny little black seeds, but this plant has more omega-3 fatty acids than even fish. And it has one of the greatest vitamin A contents that I know, and it was apparently Gandhi's favorite food, which is pretty neat. So I love eating the purslane whenever it's growing in the sidewalk cracks or in my gardens, and we integrate it into our cafe a lot too. And then there's the clover. All the, the three-leaf clovers have roots so deep, they pull up minerals from 100 feet. When you eat those clover flowers and leaves, build your bones and strengthen your teeth. And of course, the clovers are just some of the best pollinator food, forage, nectar plants that I know of from, you know, there's so many different kinds of clovers, like the alfalfa or the yellow sweet clover, or this is an alpine clover found up in the mountains. Um, there's a big head red clover. And so these plants are just so valuable for the bees. And then what's amazing is they're so minerally dense for humans too. So I love to eat the flowers myself. And sometimes the leaves are a little too strong to just eat them. So I like to dry them and then use them as tea. But that's a fantastic way to get the minerals in our body. And if I think about food in general, the way I look at food is I'm looking for three main things, which comes down to one thing. But the three would be the mineral content and the enzymes. Is it alive and vital? And the chlorophyll. And so if there's chlorophyll and enzymes and minerals, that is an incredible benefit to our body. And it's, you know, the closer we can imitate nature and how we eat, the more vital life force that we get from our food. And so that just means, hey, the more we can not process it or package it or ship it or preserve it and ship it across the world, we're, every time we do any of those steps, the vital life force goes down. And if we eat closer to a wild animal, which is just to eat directly from Mother Earth, this incredible garden, we just go out, pick, and chew. 
And the life force is at the highest. It's like the highest octane for our bodies. And the more we can do that, the more potential of humanity, I think, we can become more of a noble species that really does have that giving and receiving. We give back as much as we're taking. And we're actually then contributing to a better world on every level when we're aligned in that next level of being a steward of the earth. So all the wild mustards with their petals of four are spicy and sweet enough to make you want more. Their flowers come in yellow, pink, purple, and white and get your creative juices flowing into the night. And so there's all different kinds of wild mustard. This is actually a watercress that's growing in some water, but there's mustards everywhere across the globe. And again, they're one of the best um, bee foods, bee pollinator foods, the wild mustards. And there are so many different kinds of varieties. And they all taste really spicy, generally speaking, and they all have four flower petals. So it's good to, it's an easy way to identify a mustard. And then there's a plant that's in the, it's a knotweed, and there's a really low growing knotweed. There's um, mountain knotweeds. There's a Japanese knotweed. There's so many different of the knotweeds, but they're again, a good food and medicine. And one year I was hiking to Telluride and I came across this alpine knotweed and it was so packed with seeds that I just, re it sort of broke my mind open of, wow, you don't need to bring food when you go into the woods because the woods, at certain times of the year, like in August, it's just loaded with nutrition because a tiny little seed like this is so dense in carbohydrates and fats and nutrition, especially when I'm eating it directly. And I found myself kind of uh, just opening to the greater potential of how much this earth nourishes our bodies. And then there's the wild spinach called lamb's quarters. And it has more protein, probably 60% more protein and iron than spinach does and some of these other minerals. And so I just love to see how much um, these plants, we don't even have to grow them. We just go out and harvest them and put them into our salads and our sandwiches or into our meals. And it gives so much nutrition. And all the wild lambs quarters create a seed and that seed is quinoa. And there's a lot of different varieties, probably 200 different species of lambs quarters, even just in our area. And um, all of them have an edible seed. Some of them are easier to harvest than others, that's for sure. But if you take the time, you can, um, you can get this incredible food. It's like a pseudo grain. It's a complete protein and it's a fantastic support for our diet. And all the wild grasses with their eight or nine amino acids are survival food and it could save your asses. <laughs> so the, the wild grass is another incredible food that has um, all the trace minerals, all those rainbow spectrum of nutrients that the earth can provide. I mean, almost all of them out of, um, I guess out of 108 minerals that plants generally can uptake, grass has about 98. So it's just incredibly dense. And I love to chew on grass, but then it has so much fiber that I end up spitting the fiber out, but then I get those juices and all the nutrition, the chlorophyll, the minerals, and the enzymes from just chewing the grass. I also like to, in the morning, go out with my blender and I'll take some scissors and cut the grass into little pieces and make a beautiful grass green juice. And it's a very healing and re-energizing drink in the morning. And grasses are also a great pollinating, um, great for the pollinators. The little grass flowers are often visited by all the different bees and, and pollinators too. And we grow a lot of wheatgrass in our cafe. And sometimes we drink so much grass, it goes to our heads <laughs> and we get in trouble. Anyway, we have fun with, we have a bicycle powered wheatgrass juicer that we pedal over to the farmer's market and give people wheatgrass shots for people as well. And so this presentation, I'm just gonna close it with this quote that a weed is a plant whose virtues are celebrated across the globe. And that's a really nice quote. There's so many other quotes. I loved Emerson's quote, which I actually had as a child hanging in our bathroom in my family's house that said, what is a weed? 
A weed is a plant whose virtues are yet to be discovered. And I think I meditated on that, that question my whole life and it probably directed me <laughs> into this pathway. And there's a really another, another fun quote that's, what is a weed? A weed is a plant in a place with a person with a problem. <laughs> and so it's a great permaculture perspective to realize that if we're thinking something's a weed, maybe we just need to change our, our lens and start looking at that weed as a resource. What can that weed really do for us? And what is it doing for the pollinators and what is it doing for the earth? And so I, um, I know that we're gonna be doing some question and answers at the end of this presentation. And I'm certainly um, could continue speaking or um, I also could stop sharing this uh, slideshow and then continue with um, just speaking a little bit too. How are we doing with our timing? Um, we're doing great. We have, um, I think we're gonna start question and answer at 735, so if, you, if you'd like to. Um, okay. But no pressure, great. you can also start now. Yeah, great, great. Um, let's see, I guess I'll just speak a little bit about our farm. I have this uh, Turtle Lake Refuge. We have a farm that's about seven miles outside of town. And then we have the cafe and the educational center here in town. And so we have a lot of things going on from uh, different wild plant classes and permaculture retreats out at the farm, as well as um, wild plant walks around town. And we're uh, really encouraging people getting involved and learning what can you eat in your own backyard? Because it's incredible how not only do we save money, but we're actually being so kind to the earth to get our food more directly from where we live. And what I've discovered is that when I eat something from the wild, there's such intelligence in that wild plant that it hasn't, especially the weeds, it's interesting, they're so resilient and so, uh, they're so vital and if they can adapt to change. They're one of these plants that the wild weeds can be, you know, exist in really hot climates and cold climates and really dry environments and very wet. And they're so able to adapt to change that to eat them, we actually start adapting to change ourselves better. It's like one of the best things we can do for climate change. I don't know, you know, how much we have control on stopping some of these progressions that we're witnessing in, in our environment. But if we ally with the wild weeds and the wild plants, they teach us from the inside out how to be better stewards of planet Earth. And that wild intelligence goes into our body and on a very cellular level, starts to build who we are and how we think and how we engage with our relationships. And so I've just found it to be a profound uh, pathway to getting more receptive to our, um, all of our relations on this world, in this life. And I find that the plants are my greatest teachers. And I've felt such an honor to having been so challenged by having this herbicide chemical company live next door to me for so many years and have it really motivate me to write the book about the values of wild plants as well as to really start moving our city towards more organic practices and creating organic parks but now to have this opportunity to remediate that land has been such a miracle and what's incredible is we have this shed that was called the stinky shed because that's where they stored all their chemicals and they had 10 different herbicides stored in that shed in in huge thousand gallon tanks and every year they would spray out the tanks and wash their tanks and it would be right on our border of the property right next to the gardens and it was the stinkiest um, neighbor that i could imagine well that stinky shed all after all the chemicals got moved out you know, it had a concrete floor and concrete is very porous. And so a lot of those spills got just taken into the concrete. And I didn't really know what to do, but what we started doing was using all this clay. I had a potter friend who dropped off tons of old clay pots and buckets and buckets of old clay. And so we rehydrated this clay 
and applied it to the concrete with boots and we did slip and slide parties. <laughs> and then we let that clay dry, kind of like a facial mask, and then scraped off all that clay and then put it into you know, containers and then reapplied new clay, let it dry, scraped it off. And when I was taking this old clay that had been drying out the toxins, I distributed a kind of in really small doses around county roads, kind of like dilution is the solution. But I knew it worked because the clay actually smelled like herbicides. It really did draw out the toxins. And then since then, we've sealed the building with this safe seal and organic product, and we're transforming this stinky shed into a schoolhouse. So it no longer has the stinky shed name, and now it's this really beautiful and sweet smelling place that we're gonna be hosting workshops and doing education on organic stewardship and permaculture and um, good ways of being in sustainable relationship with our environment. So it's an amazing transformation on a lot of levels that I feel honored to be a participant of. And um, yeah, I guess I'll close with that, but thank you so much. Actually, maybe I'll close with one little wrap. <laughs> There's a secret right beneath your toes. From the ground is where the riches grows. Everywhere in the world where humans live is a free superpower that nature gives. You have 13 weeds from which to choose. Use your intuition and you can't lose. You are wise, so when you take a little bite, ask how much or how little to you feels right. Look, all of the wild animals know what to do. Eat your wild greens and join the zoo. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so oh, thank you so much, Katrina. That was great. Um, I had uh, I was fortunate enough to attend you, one of your talks a couple of years ago at Peaceful Belly Farm, um, and you made the green juice, and it was delicious. And I've made it definitely a few times since then. So I look at weeds in a whole new way. Um, so thank you so much. All right, so we'll go ahead and um, open it up to questions. If you want to go ahead and type your questions in the chat. And we'll see if we can get to as many as we can. If you have a question for a particular speaker, go ahead and indicate that as well um, in the chat. So we'll give, it looks like we already have a couple. This one, um, let me scroll up. I think Melanie answered those in the chat. Um, so this is from Jessica. So the mushrooms, um, so I think this is for, for Katrina, what you're just talking about with the concrete um, area or your neighbor. Um, so the mushrooms are able to break down the chemicals or do you have to dispose of them for a while? Well, with the mushrooms, I learned, I first just was using oyster mushrooms and I would use the mycelium, which is kind of like a block of their root, you know, their root, um, their mycelium is what it's called, the roots of the oyster mushroom. And we would break that up into sawdust and add water and, and then just apply that all across the land and then add more mulch. And our plan was not to eat those mushrooms. We're just using it to break down. But it's incredible. Mushrooms, as well as many other microorganisms, have this ability, they have this enzyme that can break down the pheno compounds <clears throat> of petrochemicals into inert compounds. So um, some people say you could eat the mushrooms, um, but we're, we're not doing that. We're just letting it break down and then recompost and recompost and yeah. And then I also discovered though that I don't have to just use oyster mushrooms. Any moldy straw that you'll find or a bunch of leaves that have the white netting that you'll see that's the mushroom. There's many other local strains of mushrooms that do the same good remediating work. And I learned that through um, just harvesting some mushrooms that I didn't plan to plant there and they actually smelled like herbicides so I knew they were breaking it down yeah oh and just to follow up while we're still on that topic um do you feel like they would ever be okay to eat then or not I think eventually time is on our side if we give things a little more time we gave the land a minimum of three years and I didn't even know if it could happen that fast but we actually found that through a lot of um, action, you know, on our part to help nature break down quicker by inoculating the land, that three years 
uh, we're going to be able to grow food. So maybe at least three years, and then who knows? Um, I'm actually going to send off some mushrooms to get tested to see if they have any um, residues left. Cool, thanks. Um, so here's a question from Robin. Um, so she says, she's, I'm in, a, I'm in the master gardener class and they were talking about Roundup and they were saying it's safe and only has a short half-life of like 145, or sorry, not 145 days. But I went to a beekeeper's talk and he was saying that you need to take some of the panels out every year so the bees don't die from the Roundup in the hive. Um, so that tells me that Roundup does not have a short half-life. Someone, maybe Melanie, anyone um, can speak to that. I could speak to it if, if yeah, you know, someone absolutely. else yeah. wants to. Um, but yeah, what my understanding with Roundup is that it's it's more like seven years. Like there's the glyphosate that it's it doesn't break down very well. And it on the fine print, they even say, you know, if your cow, if your cow or your horse or whatever um, eats hay or grass that has been sprayed with Roundup it's going to go through the digestive system and then they're going to put it out in their manure and the Roundup is still going to be in the manure. And so it's really actually kind of dangerous to use their manure in your gardens because it will continue to kill plants for up to seven years at, at least. So for bees health as well, yeah, avoid that at all costs. <laughs> yeah, I would just add that, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's interesting how readily available it is you know, you walk into any big box store and it's like huge display right by the doors, you know. Um, and it's, um, it's definitely concerning. So I, I do some work with what's called the Taos County Invasive Weed Working Group, and, um, which is in northern New Mexico. And it actually was started because there was a, a community member who was getting sick and she was she's got an autoimmune um, condition and so she kept noticing that her flare-ups would be after the city would come and spray um, and so she brought attention to it um, and basically it ended up developing into this working group because our we were trying to work with the county to if they're gonna spray to have it be a last resort and if they are going to spray, they have to put notice up a week before spraying and leave it up for up to a month after spraying so that people would be informed about it. Um, and I think she also got like a few of the local stores. I mean, Taos is a pretty small community, but, um, you know, so we only have like Walmart, I think, is the biggest sort of box store there. <laughs> There's a couple Ace Hardwares, but everything else is real local, local stores, mom and pop shops. And... Um, the city passed an ordinance so they were you know shelf talkers have to be put up about how it's detrimental to varying life forms um and it's you know i don't know i kind of feel like it's it's a no-brainer <laughs> i mean anytime you're gonna put something that's gonna kill something it's you know it's it's um it's gonna have broader ramifications than we probably know and i find it very interesting that you know the proof of burden or or you know how that goes about is that we don't have to show that it's okay. We just have to show that it doesn't immediately kill bees. Like for instance, right now there's um, there's a big issue out in California, especially with the queen producers there who are around like Chico, a little bit north of Sacramento area, and there's that's where a lot of the spring bees are produced, at least for the western region region that then get you know distributed. And their, their issues with IGRs or insect growth um, regulator hormones that orchardists are using on the trees to affect, you know, quote unquote, the bad bugs. And the label shows that it doesn't kill adult bees. Well, right, it doesn't kill adult bees, but it does affect all those, you know, the larval and pupil stages of the bees and the queens. So you've got this huge, you know, this huge issue that it's, what's on the label may show that it doesn't out and out kill an adult insect, but we don't know how it affects the developing insect. And so even with Roundup, I mean, which is obviously an herbicide that's very different than say a pesticide, but all of these have ramifications that we don't fully know yet. And I think it's really interesting that we, we don't require that sort of burden of proof from these, 
from these companies until it's, you know, sadly too late. Oh, and it looks like um, Joel sent, um, he said that he saw a paper on Roundup and Bees this week, and he also um, sent the link in the chat if anyone's interested in looking at that. Um, I think we have yeah, time. That, for, oh, go ahead. That paper was kind of interesting in that it was not the active chemical in Roundup that was killing the bees. It was one of the adjuncts that go with it. Um, so that's just one piece of the puzzle. Melanie was right that some of the more, the harder things to track down into the impacts of these chemicals to bees are the sublethal effects. It's one thing if you spray something and it kills everything, you're like, wow, that was bad. It's another thing if it makes them, reduces their you know, immune system response or they only produce six eggs instead of 600. And so it looks like they're healthy but they're the sublethal response. And those are the ones that we're starting to learn more about with chemicals um, and how they're applied. But I happened to see that paper this week. It hit my inbox. I thought it was kind of interesting. So I tossed it in there. Cool, thank you. Um, let's, I, mean, I think we have time for one last question. Um, so any solutions to the weed white top? Um, it doesn't seem to have much value besides flowers for bees. Um, and it's pretty invasive here. We have it everywhere on our property. <laughs> well, I could speak a little bit to that. There might be other people who can too, but the flowering white top is a mustard. And so it is an edible plant and you know, you can, you can make a pesto with it or make your own mustard sauce. And, and I would say, you know, when it's good for the bees, that's pretty important. That's a pretty priority thing. And you know, we can get rid of it, but then there might not be as much food for them. And, you know, you could, uh, you know, what we do is we spread other flowering plants and other seeds out there if you're going to exchange something. But, you know, you might think of, okay, if that's good for them, let's see if I want to exchange it for something else that's also really beneficial for them. But it does have great value in um, pulling up different minerals and, and bringing those minerals to the topsoil as well as it is edible. Cool. Thank you. All right, so it looks like we're at time for the end of the event. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for attending um, our event tonight. Um, a huge thank you to our speakers, Joel, Melanie, and Katrina. Um, just a reminder that our plant pickup for the pollinator project is next Thursday, April 29th to Sunday, May 2nd from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day at Vine and Branch Ranch in Caldwell. We'll go ahead and send out um, this video to your email and post it on our YouTube when we um, when we're all done with it. Um, and we still have some flowers left, uh, so please share with anyone who might be interested. They make great gifts as well. Um, so thank you everyone and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you all, it was wonderful. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>